It's dirt sweat veg, exposure to nature, soil microbes, and that can be you sitting outside hugging a tree or it can be the food you eat that ideally is grown in microbially rich soil. Go to the farmer's market, get the funny looking carrots with the dirt on them that, you know, that all have little fingers coming out of them. So dirt is essential for our microbiome. Sweat, exercise, movement, also really essential. So if we're not moving, neither are our bowels. And we know that our digestive tract is a main organ of elimination. So we want to be eliminating things, not just products of digestion, but also viruses that may get into our bodies. We want to keep it moving. That's the sweat. And then veg. We want to eat more vegetables. I'm a big smoothie person. I blend them. I saute them. I boil them. I steam them. Just eat some and, and you know, head towards that goal of 30 different plants a week and you'll be in good shape. Robin, welcome. It's so good to see you. Thank you, Jason. It's wonderful to be with you. I wish I were down there in Miami hanging with you by the water, but this is going to have to do. <laughs> and we definitely need to do that. And I, I think the last time we saw each other was at our Revitalize event in 2015 in Arizona, I believe. It's been a while. So what have you been... And you also spoke in 2014. And we were just reminiscing before we hit record about how great those events were. And you were talking about the microbiome in 2014. And I remember there were a lot of oohs and ahs in the audience and it was still early. And, and here we are today. Microbiome seems to be ubiquitous. So, so what have you been up to since 2015? Please tell us. I am still talking about the microbiome, Jason, but the difference is now everybody else is talking about it too. And so you're right. And again, that was just such an incredible event. I mean, now there's so many established wellness communities, but you know, back then there just wasn't the kind of community and conversation and particularly live that you created. So I was, you know, we were chatting about all these fantastic people who I'm still in touch with, folks from Sakara and Joe the Juicer. And so again, just want to say thank you for, for providing that opportunity and continuing to provide it. I have been writing books since then. As you recall, the first one, Gut Bliss, was 2013. Second one, The Microbiome Solution was in 2015, right after that first Revitalize event. The second one, the third one, the bloat cure was 2016. And, you know, Jason, I thought I sort of had, you know, said what I had to say. I'd written these three books on digestive health, all a little bit different. The first one, Gut Bliss, is sort of general introduction to gut health. The second one, the microbiome solution was dove really deep into the microbiome. And the third one, the bloat cure was a quickie, 101 things that bloat you A to Z. And then the pandemic happened and we started seeing all these articles that were, you know, stuff uh, as a gastroenterologist wasn't surprising to me. Stuff like the fact that if you're blocking stomach acid, you're at a dramatically increased risk of COVID or that the microbiome is a more accurate predictor of outcome from COVID than anything else. But I realized there just really wasn't great public health awareness. So people are aware of the gut as a digestive organ. But the idea of the gut as a defensive organ really wasn't on most people's radar. So I thought, okay, time to put my nickel down again and, and do a little bit of, uh, of education around this topic. And it, I, I want to point out, you're not just someone who writes books. You're, you're actually a real-life MD who practices medicine. So talk a little bit about your, your practice, your background, your credentials before we go right back to the microbiome and what led you to write the antiviral gut. And we, re we really missed the microbiome in medical school, I'll tell you that. We were busy trying to figure out how to sterilize everything. So I went to Columbia for medical school in New York, had a fantastic time there, spent eight years there. So medical school, residency, I was a chief resident there. And then I went downtown from Columbia up in Washington Heights to Mount Sinai, which is, you know, is really sort of Upper East Side, but downtown to those of us who'd been at Columbia. And I did my GI fellowship there, my gastroenterology fellowship. And I was really fortunate to to work under the tutelage of some incredible people. In fact, Dr. Crone, Burl B. Crone, who first described Crohn's disease in the 1930s, along with doctors Oppenheimer and Ginsburg, he wasn't alive when I was there. I'm not that old. But his protege, Dr. Henry Janowitz, who was already in his 80s, was there in Crone's old office. And we all did rotations. We called it the Dr. J Fellowship. So we were in Dr. Crone's old office at his desk with his protege, Henry Janowitz, seeing all these people with inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, these autoimmune GI disorders. And some of them had been Dr. Janowitz's patient for 50, 60 years. I mean, it was just an incredible lineage of really 
seeing, you know, how to take care of these patients. And, and one of the things that left such an impression on me was that Dr. J, as we called him, he had this wonderful old British assistant, Ray, and they do office hours during lunchtime. They basically didn't, they just worked all the time, but they would do office hours. And Dr. J was kind of hard of hearing. So Ray would be on the line with him, helping him hear. And somebody would say they were having a flare up and he would say, well, just come right in. Can you get a taxi? We'll be here. And sometimes we waited till eight, nine, ten o'clock, Jason, for patients to come for him to see them. So the idea is that like when somebody is struggling, like you make yourself available, like that's how it works. And when I joined the faculty at Georgetown in 1997, and this is, you know, a large teaching hospital like Mount Sinai, and the GI fellows would hear me in between doing procedures, calling patients and saying like, well, I can come in early tomorrow to see you. They were sort of like, oh, like our, our waiting time is four months. And I'm like, well, what do you, you know, if your patient's having a Crohn's flare now, like what good are you to them four months from now? So that was, that was one of, I mean, in addition to learning an incredible amount about gastroenterology and inflammatory bowel disease, I really learned so much about the service aspect of medicine from, you know, 87 year old Dr. Henry Janowitz and lots of other people that, that we are here to really relieve suffering. And sometimes we can cure diseases or put it into remission. Sometimes we can't. But relieving suffering also has a lot to do with being available, validating what people are feeling, all these other things that sound really touchy-feely, but are are so important to, you know, what I consider the art of medicine. And I think in terms of Western medicine, we're we're quite good at acute care about keeping people alive for for much longer, for, yeah, uh, but not so good on prevention, addressing root causes, which brings us back to the microbiome and your work as a gastroenterologist. And so what do we know about the microbiome and its role in everything? What, what's changed since we last spoke in 2015? Where's the science today? Yeah, there are two trends, I would say. One is because of general awareness of the microbiome and its importance to both health and disease, um, there's an incredible amount of science. I mean, if you look just at the pandemic, the amount of articles linking you know, microbial diversity, et cetera, with outcome. So that, that graph is a steep increase in terms of the amount of scientific data. But at the same time, Jason, what we've seen is in the general population, this idea that you know, I can take a probiotic to fix everything that's wrong with me. So people are trying to draw this straight line between fatigue, brain fog, mood, et cetera, and what's going on in their gut. And for sure, there is a really incredibly strong contribution. So if we look, for example, at the gut-brain axis and the bidirectional communication that happens along the vagus nerve and through, you know, we know that most of these, many of these neurotransmitters like serotonin are primarily produced in the gut and so we see this bidirectional communication that the gut can control these tra- the production of these transmitters, which can affect mood, behavior, et cetera. And we see in the other direction that the brain can control or influence gut motility, secretion of enzymes, absorption and assimilation of nutrients. But again, it's not a straight line. That doesn't mean that if you have depression or anxiety, it is 100% because your gut microbiome is messed up. That could certainly be a contributing factor. Dysbiosis is sort of disruption of the microbiome, but there are genetic factors or environmental factors or situational factors that go into it. So at the same time, it's sort of an odd like accelerator break because at the same time that the science is accelerating in this incredibly exciting fashion, like how did we miss that? How did we not realize that? At the same time, we're trying not to oversell the microbiome and make people think that this is just, you know, you just go to the store and buy the right probiotic and all is well. And so for people to really appreciate the complexity of how diseases are made, often not born, the genes are just a suggestion, but that it is a contribution of so many things. It is, sure, the gut bacteria, but the gut bacteria are genetics and the diet and medications and exposure to nature and sleep and stress and so many other things. So we have to pay attention to all of those things because they really, in, they all inform the health of the microbiome. So if it's clear the microbiome is connected in one way, shape or form to everything, you know, brain health, immune health, 
list goes on skin health list goes on do we have yet a really good way of measuring the health of our microbiome in the same way if i'm concerned about cardiovascular health there's a standard lipid lipid panel you can do you can do a calcium score or scans and, and get like a very solid understanding of where you stack up with your risk for cardiovascular disease. With regards to the microbiome, can you get a test? Like if you feel good, if everything feels good, but can I get a test that will assess my overall microbiome? We have some testing that's helpful for when it's really diseased. And the same is true. I mean, I really like your cardiovascular analogy. So if you do, for example, a stress test, if you have significant coronary artery disease, That will probably pick that up, but not always. So, you know, these tests are good for diagnosing sort of extremes of disease, right? But there's a lot of stuff that a basic stress test is going to miss. There's stuff that an EKG is going to miss. An EKG electrocardiogram is sort of one point in time. You could be having palpitations and arrhythmias that it's not going to catch. And even a 24-hour Holter monitor test, which is sort of like a 24-hour EKG, is going to miss stuff. But if you have, you know, if you have significant coronary artery disease, it's probably going to get picked up on the stress test. If you have uh, an arrhythmia like atrial fibrillation and you're in and out of AFib, as we call it, multiple times a day, it's probably going to pick it up. So there are nuances. But here's the thing. Microbiome testing is really in its infancy. So again, we can't draw that straight line. And just like the cardiovascular analogy, we may be able to diagnose the problem But what we should do therapeutically is not always so straightforward. So, for example, we could do a lipid panel and say, okay, you have high triglycerides and your HDL is too low and your LDL is too high. But there's a lot of debate about how we solve that, right? Do we introduce more plants into the diet, which is a really effective way to do that? Cut down on animal protein? Do we use a statin? Do we use a supplement? How do we do that? And so there's, um, you know, it's sort of this... It's this need we have to have these straight lines and say, I have this, therefore I'm going to take this pill and I'm going to solve the problem. And um, that's that's not always how it works. So so on that note, I think to some degree, look, I, we believe in bioindividuality. Uh, genetics play a role here. The example I'll use, you know, t- t- two, two of my friends in this world, Rich Roll, who's 56, our mutual dear friend, who's does not eat any animal products whatsoever. Fantastic shape. I have another friend, Mark Sisson, who lives in Miami, who's 69. He eats a ton of animal products. You look at, you look at the both of them. I want to look like either of them when I get to 56 or 69, they're in great shape, they're energetic, but they have really nothing in common other than they both work out a lot. (laughs) They may, have more in common, they may have more in common with the diet than you think. So it may also be what they're both not eating. They're both probably not eating a lot of ultra-processed foods, Correct. a lot of proce- refined carbohydrates, a lot of sugar, things like that. Because if you look around the world, you know, you can look at populations like the Inuit, et cetera, where they're eating a high proportion of animal fat and protein based on what's available – or other populations in parts of Southeast Asia where they're eating, or you look at like the Mossi tribe in Burkina Faso, they're eating like their Neolithic ancestors and eating a tremendous amount of plant fiber and occasional termites for animal protein. And they have very- Can you pause there? Did you say termites? During the rainy season, yeah. Okay. I didn't know that was a thing. (laughs) That that is a thing in Bullpon, Burkina Faso, if you were part of the the Mossi tribe or, or ethnicity. And so they're eating, you know, sorghum with a lot of vegetables that they're grounding into this sort of porridge. But when we look at these similarities, we see that these foods are typically locally produced, whether that's locally grown or locally caught. There's virtually no packaged food. And there's a lot of physical activity, typically. And there's physical activity involved in procuring the food. Now, I don't think Rich is necessarily growing all his own vegetables, but he's probably, you know, running 20 miles before he eats them. And the same for your friend. And and what I want to say is that I am all for microbiome testing because it contributes to the science, but really in, in a more scientific way. So I love organizations like the American Gut Project, founded by Rob Knight and others, where they 
collect samples, stool samples, they do analysis. The data bank is open to researchers from around the world, and they're able to come up with incredibly important research, like their study from 2018 that showed that eating 30 or more different plant foods per week was associated with a healthier microbiome. And the interesting thing to your point, Jason, about that study is that it didn't matter whether you were vegan, lacto-ovarian, vegetarian, pescatarian, flexitarian, carnivore, omnivore, what mattered is how many plants you ate. And so that would probably be a feature of rich. And your friend is Sisson. What's his first name? Mark Sisson. Mark. So Rich and Mark probably have, again, more in common than it seems at first blush with not a lot of processed foods, not a lot of refined sugar, and probably lots of plants. 100% agreed. And I think that's that's the one thing that most people can agree on in a world where we don't seem to agree on much in terms of nutrition. A lot of the science is contradictory, is avoid processed food. And we're getting really important data from organizations like the American Gut Project. So we're understanding more about these sort of microbial signatures. So for somebody with Crohn's, what are some of the microbial signatures? What are some of the species or strains that we see overrepresented and underrepresented? And again, it's not just the organisms, it's also their metabolites. So that science is important and it has to happen at a population-based level. It doesn't help us to know what one or two people look like. We want to know what 100,000 and 200,000 people look like. But the other important thing for people to understand is that dysbiosis, this sort of alteration, interruption, disruption of the microbiome, can both be a cause of disease as well as an effect. And so if you look, for example, at SARS-CoV-2 and COVID, we know that people who have a dysbiotic gut are at increased risk for worse prognosis. But we also know that the binding of the virus of SARS-CoV-2 to the ACE2 receptors, and remember, they're about 100 times more receptors for SARS-CoV-2 in the gut than they are in the lungs, the binding to that receptor can induce dysbiosis. The ACE2 receptors can also control some of the levels of different bacteria. So again, you, you find that sort of it's cause and effect. And so sometimes it's hard for some of these diseases to figure out whether the dysbiosis is causing the disease or it's a result of the disease. And so I think that's something people have to keep in mind with some of the testing also. And, and so staying on processed food for a moment, in your opinion, is it the processing that's problematic? Is it the fact that the labels aren't good in terms of they've got too much sugar or too too many uh, unrefined or refined, refined carbohydrates? Uh, or is it something else? Like what, what, is, what does science say about what is it in the processing process that makes processed foods problematic? Or is it not that at all? Is it the label? What's in it? It's, it's really all of those and, and maybe one more. So let's start with the processing. When we and, and that's true even for something like an apple versus applesauce. Nutrients and microbes do not have an infinite shelf life. And so the closer you are eating the food to the source and to when it was actually on the tree in the ground or wherever it was, typically the more nutrients you're getting. And certainly from a microbial point of view, it's going to be microbially richer than if it you know, came on a boat from Chile uh, you know, three weeks ago and it traveled 3,000 miles and then it took another three weeks to get to you. And if you think about something like an apple versus applesauce, there's no applesauce, tree, bush, plant, et cetera. So applesauce has to come out of a factory or, or somebody's kitchen maybe, but let's say we're buying it in the store. It's not so, from somebody's kitchen. And so in the process of doing that, you know, they're cooking the apples or doing things to the apples. And it's a different product from a nutritional point of view, a microbial point of view. The labeling is a close second here because they, as you and I know, and many of the people listening, there are many substances that food manufacturers can add in and not tell you specifically what they are. And natural flavoring is one of them. So whenever you see natural flavors, you should immediately think on natural flavor and go in the other direction. So the, um, you know, the USD and the FDA both give broad, broad, um, you know, opportunity for both pharmaceutical manufacturers as well as food manufacturers to put all kinds of stuff in food. If it's a below a certain percentage level, depending on the food group, they don't have to report it. They can you know, lump things onto these sort of natural flavors, natural coloring with a whole lot of chemicals. So the labeling is a problem. 
The other thing is what is added in. So the whole goal of processing is to make these foods shelf stable. If you bought an apple from the farmer's market and put it in your pantry, it's going to be bad in a few weeks or maybe less, maybe more, depending, but it's going to go bad within some relatively short period of time. You can put applesauce in your pantry and it's good for a year. How is that possible, right? How is it that the expiration date, or you think about canned beans, how is it that the expiration date that this stuff can last so long? I think about coconut milk in the can. So I'm from Jamaica and um, my dad's family's Indian and we use a lot of coconut milk in everything that we're making. And we would, you know, somebody would crack the dried coconut and they would grate it on the grater and then they boil it in with the rice and beans or put it in the curry, whatever we're using it to make. And we would often make some coconut milk and put it in the fridge. And within about two weeks, that coconut milk is rancid, even refrigerated. But yet I can buy coconut milk in a can and put it on my pantry and, oh, it's good for two years. Like, abracadabra. So there are stabilizers in those products to make them shelf stable. There are emulsifiers, because one of the things you'll notice if you've ever made coconut milk, almond milk at home, oat milk, is that it separates, right? The thicker part and the more watery part. But when you buy these products, they're, they're pretty well mixed in. So they're emulsifiers, not that different from the emulsifier you would use in paint, to kind of bind it all together. And we have a lot of literature showing, a lot of scientific data, that a lot of those emulsifiers, the carrageenan, the guar gum, the soy lecithin, that they are harmful, not just to the potentially to the microbiome, but to the gut lining. So we had a really interesting article last year showing that for people with Crohn's disease, these emulsifiers can both precipitate Crohn's in somebody who might be genetically predisposed, plus been on a lot of antibiotics, plus not had a great diet, maybe under a lot of stress that you add a lot of emulsifiers and food into the mix that can precipitate Crohn's or it can worsen Crohn's in somebody who already has it. Yeah. And I, and I think, look, processed food happens. It's part of life. You can't, you can't make everything. And the example I'll use, so oat milk, you know, you look at the label on Oatly, it's terrible. Rapeseed oil is the number two ingredient, which is canola. It's a laundry list of of, of gums. It's, it's, it's awful, but I buy malk. It's a pretty clean label. There's like three ingredients and that's it. And, you know, we, we can all make better choices when we're, we're buying processed food. And, you know, I, I do want to come back to this idea of diversity. I think it's so important, you know, great point on try to avoid processed food, eat real foods. You mentioned apples and apple ciders, oranges and orange juice. N- another, another good example of that, but with regards to diversity of our diet, What do we know about the types of foods? You you mentioned plant rich. Like, can you be more specific of the types of foods that are we know are great for the health of our microbiome? Sure. And even before we get into the foods, if we think about who's doing the work, you know, so we're like the hive and we're animated by the bees, and the bees are literally the microbes, our worker bees. And they all do different things. So if it's sort of like monoculture and agriculture, if we're only growing soybean and corn, you know, that's going to do things to the soil. The monoculture is really bad for the land. So same thing. If we have, if we don't have all the different various microbes that we need, certain tasks aren't going to get done. Certain metabolites aren't going to get made. Vitamins aren't going to get synthesized. Genes aren't going to get turned on and off. So the diversity, just like, you know, in the real world, we need diversity of opinion, of thought, of of um, capabilities, we need the same thing in our gut. And how do we build a diverse microbiome? By eating a diverse array of plants. What are some of the ones we should particularly focus on? I will say in the American Gut Project, you know, you got credit for that 30 with everything, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, legumes, grains, herbs, spices, it all counted. But but I think if you were eating 30 plants and it was all 30 spices, you wouldn't, you know, because you're not getting a lot of fiber. So some of the sort of microbiome superstars, if you will, are what we call MAX, M-A-C. And that stands for microbiota accessible carbohydrates. And so those are, think beans and greens for the MAX and things like oats and uh chickpeas, lentils, split peas, all of those things are fantastic. When you think about greens, I mean, the leafy greens are important too, but really the kind of stringy fibrous greens. So broccoli with a stem, asparagus, the stalk, celery, all that kind of stringy fiber, really, really important. And, you know, people are so afraid of whole grains, like, oh, carbohydrates. But if you're eating them, I mean, not whole grains like a croissant, 
but whole grains like brown rice or, you know, some of the really interesting ones like teff that are that you can typically get in a less processed form are really, really important for the microbiome. Then you have the foods that are high in inulin. So again, you get into things like garlic, leeks, onion, that hard fiber, really great. Can you spend a moment on inulin? I think it's something we don't talk about enough. Yeah, inulin is um, a type of fiber. When you think about poorly digested fiber, indigestible fiber, like why would you be eating something that's indigestible? It's because it's not there to feed us. It's there to feed the gut bacteria. It's kind of like in breast milk. The third most common ingredient in breast milk is something called human milk oligosaccharides, HMOs. But they're completely indigestible by babies because they're there to feed the baby's bacteria so that they can sort of build up the baby's army so that the baby's microbiome can help repel staph aureus and other things on the mother's nipple. So similar with foods like inulin, That bacteria gets fermented, that fiber gets fermented by bacteria like Fecalobacterium prosnitzii, F. prosnitzii, to produce what we call postbiotics, bacterial metabolites like short-chain fatty acids, which are fuel for the gut lining and also help to modulate the immune system, keep it at that just right level, not too overactive, not too underactive. And so those inulin foods provide a lot of that indigestible plant fiber that's super helpful in terms of, you know, feeding those microbes. And the interesting thing is the microbes produce the short chain fatty acids, and then the short chain fatty acids also are sort of energy for the colonocytes, the cells lining the colon. And so let's say, you know, we're doing all this good stuff. We are eating a plant-rich, diverse diet. We are avoiding processed foods, but viruses happen. And Western medicine is pretty darn good when you are facing something acute in terms of antibiotics, uh, in terms of PPIs, which we referenced a study in 2020. So let's segue there to this crossroads, if you will, when we need medicine and we're facing something acute. And we'll maybe start with the less severe. Talk about PPIs in a study referenced in the book in 2020. Sure. That was really the turning point for me where I was like, okay, I've got to write a book about this because people really don't know. We've seen for decades, so this class of drugs, proton pump inhibitors, what you might know as a little purple pill, Nexium, Prilosec, Asifex, Protonix, Prevacid, there's a ton of them on the market. They all do more or less the same thing, which is they shut off that proton potassium ATPase, that acid pump in the stomach. And these drugs are amongst the most commonly prescribed drugs in the world. I think at one point before Viagra, they may have been the third most commonly prescribed drugs. I think they've dropped a little, but they're still definitely in the top 10. And they're super popular because they're super good at what they do. They shut that pump down and they remove stomach acid. And so a couple things for people to know. Number one, acid reflux is not caused by overproduction of stomach acid. Overproduction of stomach acid is a really rare condition called Zollinger-Ellison syndrome that we see in somewhere between one in 100,000 and one in a million people. Very rare. The vast majority of people who have acid reflux, heartburn, GERD, have inappropriate opening of that lower esophageal sphincter, that muscle that holds the stomach shut tight so that after the food comes down through the esophagus, you swallow, it goes into the stomach, it closes. And they have inappropriate relaxation. Why is the lower esophageal sphincter relaxing inappropriately because we're eating too much. We're eating a high fat content that takes longer to go through the stomach, leads to that valve popping open. We're drinking too much caffeine, alcohol, chocolate. Those things all chemically act on that sphincter to open it up. Too late at night is probably the biggest one because the GI tract has a bedtime. It, the emptying slows down dramatically as the sun sets. And so if that's when you're eating your largest meal, you're kind of sort of setting yourself up for reflux. But the pharmaceutical industry has managed to convince everybody that we all have too much acid and that acid is a bad thing, when in fact, acid is the most important element in digestion. It is digestion 101. It provides that ideal acidic, low pH milieu for the nutrients to get absorbed properly, for the digestive enzymes to work ideally. It stimulates peristalsis and a lot of other activities in the gallbladder, the liver, etc., So it's really imperative for digestion. And that's why when you look at these long-term studies of PPIs, who people have been on them for a long time, we start to see problems neurologically, cognitively, with the kidneys, with the bones, 
all these different organ systems. Because when you block stomach acid, you cannot assimilate the nutrients properly. So you think about fat soluble vitamins like A, D, E, and K. You're not assimilating vitamin D properly. You're going to be at an increased risk for fracture, et cetera. So that's why they have such far reaching implications when you're on them long term. But the other important thing, you know, if you sort of set aside digestion, is they are one of the main defensive mechanisms for when a virus or some pathogen gets into your body. You ingest it, often is how it gets in. It can get in through the airway or the stomach. And even if it gets in through the airway, it can get trapped by mucus. You cough it up and then swallow it. So it often ends up in the stomach. If you have sufficient quantities of stomach acid, that acid is going to denature and unravel the viral protein and render it inactive. And that's why that study that you referenced, Jason, from 2020, 53,000 patients, and they asked a simple question, does being on a proton pump inhibitor increase the risk of COVID? And the answer was a resounding yes. It doubles the risk if you're taking it once a day, and it increases it three to four fold if you're taking it twice a day. And so again, when we look at the numbers, we see somewhere around 80% of people on these drugs don't need to be on them. They don't have a clear indication. They don't have Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. They don't have a refractory ulcer. They haven't tried the diet and lifestyle um, sort of modifications that will be successful for most people. And that would be fine if, if it were free, right? If this drug sort of, well, you took it and it did all these great things and it didn't do anything bad. But it is it is disrupting digestion in a major way, and it is leaving you more susceptible. And then the, the third thing it's doing is that we have this natural gradient as we go from north to south in the GI tract, where the amount of bacteria increases from mouth to anus, and that's intentional. We want a lot of the bacteria in the colon for the fermentation process. We don't want a lot of bacteria in the upper GI tract. Part of what maintains that gradient is the stomach acid. So when you remove the acid, you now create a nice alkali environment for bacteria to overgrow, and you really mess up that gradient. And one of the studies from 2014 in our journal, GUT, in one of our GI journals, showed that long-term PPI use was as detrimental to the microbiome as long-term antibiotic use. So it was really startling. And, you know, I think the important point is long term. It's one thing if you're, if, it, if it's a bridge, if you're in a lot of pain, a lot of heartburn, and you need it as a bridge for a week or two, and ideally work with a healthcare practitioner, a health coach to get your diet right and address the root cause, that's one thing. It's another thing if you take it for, for years. And, and so going to antibiotic use, you know, antibiotics c- can save lives. They do save lives by killing the bad bugs, and we all know they also kill the good bugs, and you need them. I've taken antibiotics. My wife has taken antibiotics. Our kids at at one point or another have taken antibiotics. And I'm curious, is there a fine line here in terms of usage where it becomes too much, uh, ideally not a constant constant usage of antibiotics over years, but is it, and again, I know we're all individuals, it's hard to generalize, but do you have a rule of thumb when it kind of crosses a line for an individual where, you know what, this is becoming problematic? Well, in my patients who often have severe dysbiosis, I always half jokingly say to them, if death is imminent, you totally have my blessing. (laughs) You know, you've been diagnosed with a flesh eating bacteria, but really it depends on what sort of background this is occurring in. So if you are somebody with severe autoimmune disease, you've been on a lot of antibiotics, you've eaten a mostly Western diet, you've also been on PPIs, you've also taken antidepressants that can disrupt the microbiome, your threshold for what your gut will tolerate may be very different from somebody who has grown up not taking a lot of medications, lots of exposure to soil microbes, pretty good diet. You know, this is a sort of antibiotic course once every couple years. So, so much of it is this sort of harkens back to this idea of personalized medicine, right? We have to really examine the risk in the individual. But I'm going to tell you about a study that really stopped me in my tracks earlier this year. And I will say that the problem isn't the antibiotics. The problem is that we're not using them judiciously. We're using them to treat viral infections against which they have no efficacy whatsoever. A study from the journal Pediatrics showed that pediatricians prescribe antibiotics about 63% of the time when they perceive parents want them and 7% when they don't. So there's a lot of gray zone. And a lot of what we're treating is viral pharyngitis, viral otitis media, you know, viral air infections, et cetera. So 
all that's doing is killing off droves of your healthy bacteria. It's not providing any relief for the virus because, of course, antibiotics don't work against viruses. We're using them to treat self-limited infections that would resolve on their own. And, and strep is an example of that. We use antibiotics for strep to prevent two very serious but very rare complications, post-strep glomerular nephritis, which is a kind of kidney disease, and rheumatic fever, kind of heart disease, both extremely rare. You are much more likely to get antibiotic-associated diarrhea, clostridium difficile, all of these sort of antibiotic-related problems from the antibiotic than you are to get any one of those two things. And, and again, not suggesting that you don't treat your strep with antibiotics, but I am suggesting that you have, you know, a really frank discussion with your healthcare provider about whether the antibiotic is warranted, particularly if you or your kid have already been on a lot of antibiotics and are dealing with, with issues like that. So the antibiotic will make the strep last a couple of days, you know, will shorten the duration of the illness by a few days, but the strep is going to resolve. So that's an example. So we're using them to prevent infections when there's not an infection, to treat infections that would be mild and self-limited, to treat viral infections against which they have no efficacy, and for inflammation, which is really not an indication. So I see people getting put on antibiotics for acne. Acne is an inflammatory condition, not an infectious condition. And while that kind of sterilizes things and often the acne will improve initially, Often it comes back with a vengeance, and now you've created severe antibiotic resistance in this person. So you've put them at risk for not just more severe cystic acne that's resistant to the bacteria, that's resistant to the antibiotics, but it means now when they have a urinary tract infection or pneumonia or something, the antibiotics are going to be less effective. The study that really stopped me in my tracks this past spring was a study from the Nurses Health Study where they looked at middle-aged women, they defined us in their 50s who had been taking cumulatively, had taken more than two months of antibiotics over the past several years. So that could mean, you know, 10 days of an antibiotic for UTI, six days for a sinus infection, a week for something else, adding up to two months. And they found that there was a decline in global cognition in those women that was equivalent to aging the brain three to four years. And so, you know, we think about being good stewards of antibiotics. Like we don't want to create superbugs in the environment and we don't want to create antibiotic resistance, but we often don't think about what it means for our own health. And I know for so many of us, like I have a very strong family history of Alzheimer's. So, so many of us who are already worried about how our brain is going to age, who might never realize that, you know, you're taking antibiotics for that sinus infection that by the way, is going to go away on its own, most likely even though you may be a bit more uncomfortable and for longer, but that that is actually contributing to, you know, that is moving you a little faster, possibly, towards a decrease in cognition. And so I want to come back to kids for a moment, because you men mentioned kids and ear infection, and our kids have had ear infections. I've, I think I had ear infections when I was a kid. I feel like every, it's like a rite of passage as a child almost, get an ear infection. And a lot of doctors prescribe antibiotics for that. What, what should one do instead of jumping to antibiotics if a kid has an ear infection? One of the things, and as you know, Jason, my experience with my daughter as a uh, baby who was born via C-section, so missed out on that important colonization of microbes coming through the birth canal, who got strong intravenous antibiotics at birth, sort of prophylactically, she was fine, but just in case, who wasn't nursed for long because of my breast milk drying up and who received antibiotics basically on a monthly basis as a kid, ended up quite sick. And really that formed the basis for me being interested in this and really changing the way I practice and looking at things through a different lens. So what I wish I had known then when she was having frequent air infections, particularly when we traveled, was that she needed tubes in her ears. And tubes in the air is to keep that uh, air passage open when you have a child who's having, if they're having frequent air infections or frequent pharyngitis, that's something that you should ask about. And here I was, a physician, I didn't know, it was one of my mom friends who was like, oh, you should go and see Dr. Dettelbach at, you know, blah, blah, blah. A and then I asked the pediatrician, I was like, do you think she needs tubes? I mean, this is like, you know, air infection number nine. And she was like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. You know, Leah, you could, you could check that out. And I'll tell you, Sydney was probably two when she got the tubes. This is so funny. She was so ready, you know, that the pediatric anesthesiologist was like, because they, you know, they give him a little bit of gas and was like, oh, when she comes in, you can stay with her and they may squirm a little. And 
I had promised Sydney pancakes because we're not a big pancake family. And, you know, sometimes you need a little bribery for a two year old to get him to do stuff. Sydney marched into the little operating suite. She lay down on the stretcher. She reached for the mask. She put it over her face and she started going and taking the deep breaths. The anesthesiologist was like, okay, then we, we are ready to go. She was ready. But I think she was also ready, not just because of the pancakes, but she was ready because she had been struggling with these air infections and she was ready to not have them all the time. So the air infections really solved the problem. We had seen a pediatric allergist before then and had, she had chronic fluid in her airs from all the infections. And she had said, okay, we're just going to put her on antibiotics. And I said, well, for how long? She said, indefinitely. We're just going to suppress it with antibiotics. And by this time, I had had my aha moment. And, you know, you think about it now, and I think even somebody who doesn't know a lot about the microbiome would be sort of like, eh, that doesn't sound like a good idea. But, you know, 17 years ago, like, we just didn't know. We were in a very different era. And I knew enough at that point because I saw that the more antibiotics she got, the sicker she got. I knew enough to know that that wasn't a great idea and sort of declined that. But she was colonized with all this stuff. And how do we get colonized? Like we have a lot of this stuff floating around. So you think about something like C. diff. A lot of us are colonized with C. diff, but it's at low levels. But when we kill off a lot of the healthy bacteria, now it proliferates. Same for a vaginal yeast infection. We all have yeast in our in our vaginal vault, if you will. And we have yeast in our gut. Yeast is a critical, plays a critical role in digestion. But when you take an antibiotic as a woman and it kills off a lot of the healthy lactobacillus, now the yeast overgrows along with the Gardnerella and the Prevotella, et cetera. You end up with bacterial vaginosis. You end up with a yeast infection. It's really not an infection. It's overgrowth. And so I, I love introducing people to this concept of a pathobiont which is not really, it's a mix between a pathogen and a symbiont, which is, you know, an organism that's going to live harmlessly, sort of cohabitate with you. So most of the time, we're not treating, you know, we're not treating flesh-eating bacteria. What we're trying to do is we're trying to cull the overgrowth of some of these organisms that are overrepresented. But in so doing, we also, again, because all antibiotics are going to kill bacteria somewhat willy-nilly, so when we're doing that, like in the case of bacterial vaginosis and women get treated with Metrogel and things like that, it sort of wipes everything out and they feel better for a while. But as the vaginal flora starts to come back, it comes back even more imbalanced. And now we see even lower levels of lactobacillus, more Prevotella, more Gardnerella, more yeast. So we have to think about a more rewilding approach to illness. And, and I know, you know, I think as well as anybody, what it's like to have like a, a one-year-old who's screaming bloody murder and has a temperature of 104. It is frightening. And even for me as a physician, it's like, help do something, you know? So we need to, so we think about, you asked about the air infections, think about tubes. You ask the doctor, I mean, the most important question is to basically just say, is an antibiotic absolutely necessary? Number one. Number two, if we didn't take the antibiotic, what would happen? And they may say, oh, the air infection is going to last a day longer <laughs> or two days longer. You want to know what's a natural history, what's a natural course of this disease. You know, does it have the potential to resolve on its own or does it need an antibiotic? And could you use a more narrow spectrum antibiotic as opposed to something broad? And so there, there are lots of questions to ask. Um, they're all in the book, in the new book, The Antiviral Cut. And, um, you know, sometimes you're going to need an antibiotic for your kid. The idea is not to never take an antibiotic. The idea is to make sure that when you're taking it or when your kid's taking it, that they really need it. Well, well said. And, and let's bring it back to the book, you know, the antiviral gut. And, you know, if you think about our immune system, it's, you know, there are all the things that we can do to, to strengthen our immune system so that we are set up for success when that intruder inevitably comes. And then you've got the intruder, all these external factors. And I thought it was so interesting. You set the stage early in the book. You talk about germ theory versus terrain th theory. So can we go there? We can definitely go there. I remember the first time I heard in a sort of medical setting, this concept of terrain. It was a woman, Maya Shatrit Klein. She wrote a book called The Dirt Cure. She is, I believe, a pediatric neurologist. Her book's somewhere on the shelf behind me, but it would take me a minute to find it. And I was at a conference at Kripalu put on by, 
I think it was, uh, I can't remember who put it on, but it was at Kripalu. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm going. I'm going to go do some yoga and eat some plants for sure. I'm available. And uh, Maya had written this book, The Dirt Cure. And she talked about this idea of terrain that I just really hadn't heard in a medical context before. And so Louis Pasteur popularized germ theory. And germ theory says that a bad bug gets into our body and it makes us sick. And that is absolutely true. SARS-CoV-2, Ebola, HIV, bad bacteria can make us sick. But another Frenchman, Antoine Béchamp, was a champion of terrain theory. And he said, if your terrain, your soil, and by that he's really talking about the gut microbiome, is healthy, the seed, the germ, the bug, can pass relatively harmlessly through. You may have some symptoms, but you're going to survive relatively intact. And that is also true. So we wash our hands and we sort of socially distance and avoid exposure because of germ theory. But we eat fruits and vegetables and exercise and sleep and get rest and try to be healthy because of terrain theory. So this idea that host health matters, and maybe it matters even more than the potency of the pathogen, we see all the time. If we look at viruses, we know that a virus like Ebola is only able to infect and make sick about one in three adults it comes into contact with and, and a much lower percentage of children. We know that poliovirus, one in 200 people, it will penetrate that gut line and get into the bloodstream, travel to the central nervous system, and cause devastating paralysis. But the other 199 people may be asymptomatic or have mild symptoms. We know that almost 10% of people are immune to HIV. They won't become infected when they become exposed. And it's not differences in the virus that make up this difference in outcome. It's differences in us, the host. And, you know, I, I did a post uh, on Instagram. I'm not super active on social media and I'm still, I feel like I'm getting the hang of it. And I- God bless you. I, Stay that I way. I, I don't. I don't love it because it feels very. It feels very narcissistic, you know. One hundred percent agreed. <laughs> it, at the same time, so I try to just sort of put out information and be a little less look at me. But I posted something earlier this summer that was basically saying just that, giving the statistics, saying you know poliovirus, Ebola, HIV, using those examples and saying host health matters. And in the caption, I also said vaccination, social distancing, mask wearing are also very important, but, and they took it down. They said it violates, uh, you know, community guidelines. And I was like, okay, so if you're an 80 year old and you're, you have obesity and you're a smoker and you're hypertensive and you're diabetic and you have a stroke and you have a worse outcome than, you know, rich role, right? Then host health matters again with everything with heart disease, with cancer, with stroke, with infection. But yet saying host health matters with COVID is like somehow taboo. You know, it's like you're saying don't get vaccinated, which is crazy. Like, of course, these two things, these two sets of things, the external things we can do like hand washing, social distancing, vaccination, incredibly important, but complementary to the things we can do internally to be healthier. I think having any sort of discussion on COVID on social media is an impossible task. And, <laughs> and but, but Jason, Jason, you know, it's not just COVID. So a couple of days ago, when I, I was, I did a lot of research for this book. I mean, this book was harder to write than the first three books combined. And I'm very proud of it. But the science was moving so rapidly. So it was like, you know, 20 articles a day. And a lot of the research I did didn't end up in the book. A lot did, but some felt like it was too tangential. So one of the things that I looked at, because I looked a lot at other viruses, and I do talk about, you know, hepatitis and herpes virus and poliovirus and other viruses in the book. The book is not a book just about COVID. But one of the things I looked at was RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. And I also looked at rotavirus. My daughter had rotavirus when she was two. She was hospitalized. She went into kidney failure and liver failure, and she was deathly ill. Could never figure out why. My husband had just flown to Guam for work, and that is a long flight. And he had to turn around and come all the way back. And then by the time he got back, she was actually doing better. But I couldn't figure out why rotavirus. I mean, rotavirus is a diarrheal illness that kills half a million children every year, but it typically kills children in developing countries where they don't have access to hydration and so on. What I found, and we'll come back to RSV, but what I found doing research for this is that. 
preceding antibiotics, if, if your child gets antibiotics in the few weeks or days before they get rotavirus, they are going to be much more likely to become infected and they're going to be much sicker. Why? Because the antibiotics have killed off a lot of the healthy bacteria. My daughter had been misdiagnosed when she first got the rotavirus or maybe when she was just not feeling well. I took her to the urgent care center. This stuff always happens at like midnight. And they died, they looked in her ears and said she had an ear infection, which she did not. <laughs> And they put her on an antibiotic. And then three or four days later, she became deathly ill. So it wasn't until I was really researching all of this that I was like, oh my goodness, that preceding antibiotic exposure led to her being sicker with the rotavirus. So I was looking at RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. My nephew had RSV when he was a young baby, six weeks old. He was hospitalized. He'd been a C-section baby. We know that premature babies are at increased risk, small airways, et cetera. I found a study published by Vanderbilt University. It was a study done in Argentina where they did, they looked at women at the maternal diet as a predictor of outcome for RSV. And in this hospitalized population, they found RSV morbidity and mortality rates of about 12% generally. So this was a sicker population. That, that wouldn't be what it is in the general population. But they found that mothers who during their pregnancy had eaten a very sugary, starchy diet, lots of sugar-sweetened beverages. I mean, I'm not talking about fruits I'm talk or whole grains. I'm talking about, you know, bonbons throughout the pregnancy, that their babies had a 55% morbidity and mortality, much worse outcomes. And so, you know, with, with people talking about the tridemic and lots of RSV floating around and everybody's trying to figure out why are some babies sicker, I thought, let me post a study, right? And I, I posted the results of the study. And I got a lot of comments from people saying, thank you so much for this. You know, I ate a lot of ice cream during pregnancy and sweets and my baby had asthma, bronchiolitis, et cetera. I wish I had known. Um, but I got one person saying, oh, um, I, I don't like these scare tactics. I'm out. And I got another comment saying it felt like I was shaming mothers. And so I felt compelled <laughs> to get back on social media and post a video saying, that when we as a medical community realized the link between cigarette smoking and lung cancer, and we made that public, we were not shaming smokers. There are millions of people walking around today who would not be here had, had we not made that connection between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. So giving people the information is not shaming people. I mean, we, it, it's so crazy to think that you're giving people information like that, and then they're accusing you of like blaming people, pointing out that Having obesity puts you at, you know, 113% increased risk of being hospitalized for COVID and a 48% increased risk of dying from COVID is not shaming people. It is giving them information so that they can potentially act on it if they choose to. But why would we not give people that information? You know, on that note, I was surprised to find with regards to obesity and and and, and host health, it goes beyond that. I, I, I was unfamiliar with this concept of prolonged shedding and obesity. Can you talk about that? That, that blew my mind. Absolutely. I, I was unaware of it too. And I, I think most people in the medical community are unaware of it. And this is true for influenza, hepatitis, et cetera, that we do see a lot of these viruses are excreted. And we typically will see viral shedding in stool for much longer than we'll see it in the nasal mucosa. So after you swab and you're negative for SARS-CoV-2 in a nasal swab, we may still be able to detect it in the feces. And that's not a big deal because we're not going around pooing on people, right? I mean, so... Uh, the way we are coughing and sneezing. What we've found in these studies, and I said it's true for other viral illnesses, is that people who have obesity, there's longer shedding. And that may have to do with the immune activity of adipose tissue and lots of other factors, but it's detectable. And in some studies, up to 40, 42, 43% longer viral shedding. What that means is there's more opportunity also for a viral mutation and potentially mutation to more virulent to more virulent strains. And again, no part of this is meant to shame people who struggle with their weight or suggest that they are to blame for anything. It is for us all to sort of motivate and activate and say, what can we do? These are community health problems. This isn't just the problem for the person with obesity. Oh, you know, sucks to be you. Like we have to think about how we can help everyone be healthier. We are only as healthy as our least healthy citizen. 
And so I think the pandemic really showed us that. This isn't like, oh, that's your problem over there. I, I think when you talk about shedding, it is abundantly clear we are only as healthy as our least healthy citizen. It's not just about that citizen. It's about us. Um, and uh, look, there's there's so much to hindsight with regards to COVID, uh, and we don't have enough time to, to do all of that, nor I think are people interested anymore. I think they're- But Jason, to, to that point about there's so much, I, I created a free antiviral gut masterclass that's going to happen in February for exactly this reason. I got together like eight of my like you know, most brilliant doctor pals from infectious diseases, from radiology, from rheumatology, from cardiology. I got together incredible practitioners like Light Watkins, who is, you know, is a meditation practitioner, and Matt Pistona, who does breath work, and Kelly Welch, who's an acupuncturist, to all come together. And it's really great because I'm I'm filming them all now, all their talks, to talk about what looking back, what could we have done differently? And also, you know, how do they handle both sort of acute and chronic viral illnesses? But in it, so we can look back in the rearview mirror in a more leisurely way. But the idea that we just forget about this, because this is a once in a lifetime occurrence, absolutely not. We know that the likelihood of something like this happening is about 2% per year right, from researchers at Duke University, we know that we've had 30 different viruses in the last 50 years, novel viruses for which there is no treatment or cure, Ebola, HIV, hepatitis C, SARS-CoV-2. So to think that, oh, this happened, it was this unusual thing, and now we can just sort of get back to normal, we have to reflect, we have to think about what we did well, what we would do differently next time. I mean, not in an obsessive way, and I, I love the idea of doing it in a more leisurely way, right? How can we inform ourselves? Agreed. This this was not going to be our last pandemic, unfortunately. Um, and hopefully there are learnings. And and one I wanted to call in the book, and another I found to be jaw-dropping, you referenced a study on the Spanish flu. Can you talk about that, specifically recovery and what that looked like? The outdoor air factor. Yeah, this was... This was, you know, book writing in general for me, I I was an English major in college, English and biology, but I'd never written a book before, God bless. And there's so much about book writing and how you do it and publishing and all of that. But the other thing is just the learning, you know, so the three books were on digestive health. This one is all about viruses and the gut. But the, you know, for me, like you, I found this jaw dropping. There was like such a sense of discovery learning about this stuff. So the open air factor hundred years ago with the Spanish flu epidemic, one study found that soldiers who recuperated outside on cots, and there's like a great little picture in this scientific study of showing the soldiers lined up on these cots outside these tents, they had a much lower mortality. It was often the officers who got to be inside in the hospital, right? Because it's like, you're an officer, you get to be in the hospital, you're just enlisted, you're going to just be on a cot on the ground. Well, it turned out, wasn't a great idea. It was better you were better off recovering outside because the officers who recuperated inside the hospital in this study had a forty percent mortality, four zero, and the soldiers outside thirteen percent wow. mortality. And the outdoor air factor is defined as the germicidal constituent in open air that is toxic to viruses like SARS CoV two, pathogenic bacteria, etc. We don't know exactly what it is. So it's not like, you know, some company can bottle it and like <laughs> spray it. It's all these different things. We know that obviously transmission is lower outside, but we we really weren't aware that recovery is better outside. And so I was reading all these articles in fall, it, throughout 2020 and fall 2021. This book took about two years. And I came across this particular article in the fall and then was researching a lot of other elements of open air factor, how it ties into the Japanese practice of forest bathing, Shinrin Yoku. There's some really incredible associations. And I said to my husband, I said, okay, if I get COVID, because I had COVID at this point, I said, if I get COVID, definitely put me outside. I want you to put me on a little cot and you know, bring me food and bring the incentive spirometer for me to practice my breathing and some books and stuff. But definitely, I want to be outside. I got COVID right after New Year's right in the middle of a snowstorm here in DC. We had just come back from Jamaica and huge snowstorm. And he was like, okay, I'm making up your little cot for you. And I was like, no, no, I think I have to be inside. But I did every single night. I went around the neighborhood, you know, double masked, bundled up, walked around. And I, I was pretty sick the first couple of days. I felt crummy. 
lying on my back, I could literally, Jason, feel some of my alveoli in my lungs collapsing. I could feel like my breath was getting short. It's getting a little bit of chest pain. And I realized like, I got to get up. If I lie on my back like this, this is how people get secondary bacterial pneumonia because they feel crummy. They lie on their backs. They're not taking deep breaths. The alveoli start to collapse. The lungs aren't being aerated. And so I would start walking. I had my little incentive spirometer, taking my 10 deep breaths a few times a day. And, you know, this stuff makes a difference, makes a tremendous difference. At the highest level, it definitely speaks to the power of nature. We have to get outside. The, the, the healing power of nature is undisputable with science right now. Absolutely. And not just on emotional well-being and feelings of well-being, but actually on blood pressure, on heart disease, and on viral susceptibility and transmission. We take on the microbiome of our surroundings as well. Better to be in nature. For sure. And so in closing, what are are your three must-dos for our audience? They're excited to take care of their microbiome. They're going to buy the book. What, What are the three things they should do tomorrow to ensure that their microbiome is is optimal. Well, my three ride or die are really simple. And they haven't changed much, Jason, from when we first met uh, eight years ago. It's dirt, sweat, veg. Exposure to nature, soil microbes. And that can be you sitting outside hugging a tree, or it can be the food you eat that ideally is grown in microbially rich soil. Go to the farmer's market, get the funny looking carrots with the dirt on them that, you know, that all have little fingers coming out of them. So dirt is essential for our microbiome. Sweat, exercise, movement, also really essential. We didn't talk much about that other than talking about your friend, Rich and Mark, and you know they have in common lots of exercise. We know also if we're not moving, neither are our bowels. And we know that our digestive tract is a main organ of elimination. So we want to be eliminating things, not just products of digestion, but also viruses that may get into our bodies. We want to keep it moving. That's the dirt, the sweat. And then veg. We want to eat more vegetables. And I don't get, you know, I'm a big smoothie person. I blend them. I saute them. I boil them. I steam them. Don't get all cut up and cooked raw. How many grams? Do they have enough inulin? You know, just eat some and, and, you know, head towards that goal of 30 different plants a week and you'll be in good shape. Robin, thank you so much. Jason, it's a pleasure.